It amazes me that the, the, the disciples, all 12 of them, that even after walking with Jesus for three plus years, after they saw the stories, after they saw the miracles, after they even seen Lazarus raised from the dead, after they saw the 5,000 fed, the 4,000 fed, after they saw their nets break with too many fish because Jesus said, cast the net on the other side. After they saw and walked with the Son of God, Jesus told them they weren't ready. That's kind of crazy. You think of all people, the people that actually walked with Jesus were the ones more qualified than anyone else. But Jesus looked at them as he's ascending in Acts 1 and says, you need to go wait. Go wait because I'm going to send another, the comforter. And when you get to Jerusalem, another's going to come upon you so that you may receive power. After everything they've seen, they weren't ready because they didn't have the power to be the witnesses God was empowering them to be. So Acts chapter 1, they go wait. Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit falls. It gives me a revelation because what you don't have, you can't give away. When I first got saved, I had the opportunity to work in a restaurant. I waited tables for a while, so please, after Sunday, tip your servers. You know, there was a rumor when I was waiting tables, the worst day to wait was on Sunday because they said the church would come out. They said the birds would come through. I said, what do you mean by that? Cheap, 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 cheap. <laughs> Nobody wanted to work on Sunday afternoon. That, that's a shame. Let's tip. Let's tip good. That's just a plug for our local restaurants. Praise God. Anybody else wait tables in here? But I was working at this restaurant and... We were at the close of it. It was getting ready to shut down, honestly. And so we were working on limited inventory. And it would be frustrating to me as a server, a waiter, because people would come in, they would take a look at our grand menu and pick three or four things we didn't have. I remember one person in particular, he was real mad. He finally just gave up and finally said, well, what do you have? I said, that's a good question. We got this one over here and this one over here. And that's it. So we're sorry. That's the specials for today. And it gave me a tremendous revelation that I could only give what I had in my power to give. It's a frustrating thing sometimes, even for me, to want to see more and know God has more, but not yet be in that circumstance or position to give more. You ever just wanted to see a miracle so bad? You ever wanted to pray for somebody and see an instantaneous result? The disciples in waiting, they were sitting in that upper room and all of a sudden the spirit fell. The Bible says that tongues of fire appeared on all of them. They began to speak with other tongues. But I love Acts chapter 3 because it shows me they got something in that upper room besides tongues. Can I tell you the initial physical evidence may be speaking in tongues, but the abiding evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is power. You will have results when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So Acts chapter 3 comes, and it says Peter and John were on the way to the temple. As it was their custom, they went there daily. Actually, they went there three times a day. They went at 9 a.m. to pray, 12 noon, and 3 p.m. every day to pray. The Bible makes it a point to mention the lame man, obviously, because there was a miracle that occurred, but the lame man had been laid there daily. Bible says they laid him at a gate called beautiful, crippled man. He had an ugly problem at a beautiful gate. He was sitting there every day. And I ha had to ask myself, how many times did Peter and John pass this guy before? If they laid him there every day and he had been lame from his mother's womb. And they went to prayer three times a day. But something shifted between Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 3. They carried something to give. Notice the famous words. It says, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give unto you. Now, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. You're going to get something this morning if you didn't come in here with it in Jesus' name. I just declare that. We have yet to see what God wants to do. God spoke prophetically to Pastor Ron. Get ready for the fire and get ready for the harvest. So I want to try my best to preach a little bit on the fire of God if you'll let me hear. So he was sitting there and he got it. You know, he was sitting there asking for alms and he got legs. I wish I had a drummer back here. 
We want to give people the Jesus that sets free. We want to give people the Jesus that gets results and sees miracles. we got to be empowered with the Holy Spirit and with the fire of God. I want to try to pull a few things out of Exodus when we first see the fire of God mentioned and a man encounter it. Exodus chapter 2, we'll start in verse 23, and then we'll go all the way into chapter 3 to verse 8. And this is what your Bible says. Now it happened in the process of time. Notice those words, in the process of time. And we just read right over that, but let me tell you how long that was. That was over 40 years. In the process of time that the king of Egypt died, then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage. And they cried out and their cry came up to God because of it. So God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God acknowledged them. Chapter 3, now Moses, here we go. He was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire. Someone say fire. fire. But the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Why the bush does not burn. That's a, that's a pretty good uh, thing to do. I'm going to turn and check out this bush that's still burning, but yet it's not burning up. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the middle of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, if God calls your name twice, you're in trouble. You better just say what he said. Here I am. Verse 5, God said to him, don't come near me. Don't come near this place. Take off your sandals because the place you're standing is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. And I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up into a good land, a large land, a land that is flowing with milk and honey. So if you can't give what you don't have, how do you get what you don't have? Who qualifies to receive the fire and the power of God? That's a good question. So we see this story. Moses is just chilling on the backside of a desert, tending to some sheep, and all of a sudden a bush starts burning. Could I interject something here? Those that feel alone, those that feel maybe even lonely, those that feel forgotten, those that feel like they're on the outside always looking in. Those that feel like they're on the backside of what God is trying to put on the front side. Those that feel like you have been forgotten. Maybe during Holy Spirit conference you didn't get a prophetic word. Maybe Billy Burke missed your head going down the line. And you feel like God doesn't even remember who you are. But this morning, that's the first candidate that qualifies for the fire. God has not forgotten you. Today will be a day of remembrance for you in Jesus' name. Who else? Those that feel dry. Where was Moses at? He was in the middle of a desert, a dry place. Dry places causes thirst, those that are hungry and thirsty. So if you feel like you've been forgotten, you feel like you're not being used enough, you qualify for the fire. If you're hungry and thirsty today, you qualify for the fire of God. If you feel alone, he is that friend that sticks closer than a brother. You qualify for the fire today. Moses, after 40 years of just tending to sheep, because he was running from a destiny. I want to tell you this morning prophetically, stop running from your destiny. You're not fast enough to run away from God. Go ahead and surrender to the fire of God and let God infuse you so he can use you this morning. Moses encountered the fire in a dry place. But you know, every fire needs a fuel source. They say dry wood burns the best and it burns the quickest. Moses encountered a bush. He called that bush a fire that was not consuming. That's Exodus 3. Well, in Deuteronomy 4, he said of God himself that God was an all-consuming fire. So which one is it? 
Is God an all-consuming fire or is he not a consuming fire? Let me give you a revelation. God isn't here with the fire to consume inanimate objects. He's here to consume you and I. He's here to consume your thoughts, your life, your will, your emotions, your plans, your procedures, your destiny. He's here to consume all you are and everything and you hope you want to be in Jesus' name. But what did Moses do in the middle of working? Hello, middle of the work day. Can we just get unashamed for God on the job? Somebody's got a headache, just step out and pray for them and watch God burn through you on them. Maybe it's that boss that you just can't stand. Just begin to pray in the spirit before you get in there. When you walk through the threshold, over the threshold into your job, God begins to fill you up with a word for them. Moses was on the job, but he made up his mind to turn aside to see God's presence. To turn aside and embrace the fire. See, I think sometimes we just come to church out of duty, out of habit. We're too preoccupied with what's going to happen after the service. What are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? Is the reservation set or not? Is the line going to be long at the restaurant or not? Well, how about we just shift our thinking and turn aside from everything that's unnecessary, irreverent, and irrelevant, and embrace the fire of God today? What if God wants to do a little bit more in us and just come to church and leave? What if the fire of God fell even right now to fill you up? What would you do? Do you want the fire of God? Do you want more of God? Do you want to go deeper than you've ever been? Do you want to see another side of God today? He's bidding you come. The bush is on fire today. Will you turn aside and embrace it? Will you push away the preoccupation, the things that are occupying and hindering your mind from submitting to the will of God? Come to church distracted, not harvest. I said not harvest. This is going to be a place where the fire falls, the fire stays, the fire is stoked to burn inside of you to go farther than you've ever been. A lot of the religious get distracted. You know why I think that is? Because a lot of times we, we feel like we're sacrificing for God. We work the whole conference. We deserve to rest and take a Sunday off. How dare us think that we can take off some, from something that God wants to give us? How dare we treat the presence of God as common? How dare us just come in and go through the motions? Not here, not I. All it takes is one person to start a fire. It takes one person that says, use me, God. I'll turn aside. I'll forget all of yesterday and my plans after this service. I'll go after you with a full heart. That's me, God. Pick me. Pick me. Woo, come on. I wish I had three people in here hungry for God. Tired of what they've seen. Want to be a participator instead of a spectator on the things of God. They want to touch. They want to handle. They want to be used by God. They think it's a sacrifice because they haven't embraced and been touched by the fire of God yet. Can I give you another revelation that the fire of God consumes the sacrifice? See, Elijah was on the mountain, called down fire upon a sacrifice, and it destroyed and lapped up everything that was there. See, that's what the fire of God will do for you. It'll no longer be a sacrifice for you to come to God's house. It'll be a pleasurable thing. Romans 4, 17 says what? The kingdom of God is not in meat or drink, but it's in righteousness. It's in peace. And it's joy of the Holy Ghost. It's a joy to come in God's house. It's a joy to have the privilege to come here and raise our hands, to lift up those gates and let the king of glory come in. It's a joy to be saved. We've been redeemed. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so in here go ahead and give God some praise see the fire of God takes us from excuses to reasons <laughs> remember, remember when you've been in the, maybe it's just this is just me here but you've been in situations where you give excuses for not to be in church because of a b or c but now you've been touched by the fire of God you give reasons to other people to be here I can't be with you because I need to be with him you go home and people want to hang out and they want to call you and text you, but your phone is off. Do not disturb because you're with him. <laughs> you used to go home and turn on the TV and watch Netflix all night or maybe even play video games all night. And now you're in your room with your face on your carpet eating it because you just want to be in God's presence. Oh, that's your portion. That's your portion. The fire of God wants to consume all that you are. 
He wants to burn in you so you stand as a lamp and a light pulse. Someone with, with saltiness that making people want to drink what you have. It's the living water. It's that spring of life flowing up in you. Jesus, when he looked over that crowd at the feast, he noticed something was missing from the eyes of people. They were like Bono, still searching for it, couldn't find it. He said, hey, hey, listen, listen, listen. All those who that are thirsty, come unto me, and I'll give you something to drink. Because out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. There are rivers to drink from, rivers to dive in. There is a depth you've yet to experience, but I hear the master calling, come. Come and dine. I've got a table set up before you. Come and feast. I've got a table of fresh bread. Come and eat because I want to fill you. Come and drink because you're thirsty. This Jesus has more. My question to you this morning is, do you want to stay in complacency or do you want the fire of God to fall? Do you want the fire of God to fill you, encapsulate everything you are? That's a question for us to answer. Is anyone hungry here this morning? Yeah. Hallelujah. Fire in the New Testament. We see John the Baptist preparing the way for Jesus. There's got to be someone here that wants to prepare the way for Jesus to move through them. Whew, he said... He said, come unto me and I'll baptize you unto repentance. I'll put you in water. He said, but there's one coming after me <laughs> whose sandals I'm not even worthy to unloose and let off. He said, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. See, John's baptism, when you went under the water and came out, you were dry a few seconds later. But with Jesus' baptism, you come out and you're on fire forever. You don't dry off. You only heat up, baby. We're a heat-activated Christian people that want more of God. The fire of God wants to consume us. Hallelujah. It distinguishes us. You want to be different? Get on fire for God. <laughs> Every religion has a holy book. Every religion has holy clergy, holy buildings, but only one has the Holy Spirit. And that's what distinguishes us, my God. Moses knew it. That's why later in Exodus 33, he calls out to God and said, if your presence doesn't go with us, I'm not going. Because what else is going to distinguish me from every other person on the face of the planet except your presence? I went with my wife the other day to the mall. <laughs> you know, I got to be honest, I live a sheltered life. Not because my wife doesn't let me out, but. <laughs> oh, man, I go to, go to work. I come here to the ministry center office. I literally just drive here and drive home every day, come here to church and come home. I don't do anything. My wife tries to get me to go to the grocery store. I'm like, nah. Hard pass. I'm not going to do it. She's like, will you stop by the store on the way home? I'm like, nah, I can't do it. I can't do it. But we went to the mall the other day. And I don't know if it's because of me not being out for so long because of the pandemic. It's been a while. It's like a year and some change. We're walking through the mall. I kid you not. I'm like, is there a clothing shortage? Because, like, nobody's wearing anything. Girls look naked. They got bellies hanging out, boobs hanging out, butts hanging out. You know I me, mean? I'm like a horse with blinders trying to walk through. My wife's looking at me. I'm like, I'm not looking at nothing. I promise. My head's straight. She was like, you better not be looking. I see that over there. I didn't know if I was at the strip mall or the strip club. Praise God. People are dying to be different. I guess that they think that the less amount of clothes they wear, the more different they'll be. The more tats they get, the more recognizable and distinguished they would be. The more piercings they get. Can I give you another revelation? Can we just let the one who was pierced pierce us with the fire? That's what's going to make us different. You want to be different in society? Walk in the power of God. Walk into a mall with a word of knowledge. Walk into the mall with a word of wisdom. Walk into the mall with the gift of healings and see people raised up. That's the power you carry. The resurrection power of Jesus Christ, according to Romans 8, will quicken this mortal body. It wants to quicken you today. 
horse with blinders. I don't know. <laughs> don't look. <clears throat> We're just different, and we need to embrace that. I mean, I was raised Pentecostal. I was raised in the assemblies of God. Hallelujah. <laughs> and I was, can I be honest? I was ashamed as a kid in elementary school. I'd get picked on. They would ask me, is your, your dad is, has that church that they, they talk in tongues, or what is it called? I'd be like, oh, no, no, that's not my church. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> that's that church where they shout when they sing instead of stand up on the first and third stanza or hymn or whatever and sit down. Now, if somebody asked me, if you weren't Pentecostal, what would you be? I would say embarrassed because we're missing the fullness of what God has for us and what he did for us on Calvary, what he did for us when he resurrected and ascended, and what he did for us when he sent the comforter, the power of the Holy Spirit. I think it's time we need to get back to our roots a little bit more. They used to call them holy rollers back in the day. Because they would be rolling all over the floor because they would be on fire. <laughs> what would happen in here if somebody just caught fire and began to run? Caught fire and began to roll? Caught fire and began to jump the chairs? We don't have pews anymore, but jump the chairs. It's okay. Have you ever seen someone on fire before? They're a little different. They're, they don't care what you think. <laughs> they don't care what they're wearing. They don't care how their ha hair looks. They're just on fire. They can't help themselves. I don't know about you, but I learned in school when you're on fire, you need to stop, drop, and roll. So I guess that's where that terminology came from. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay to be different. It's okay to get undignified a little bit like King David dancing in his underwear. I'm not saying strip down. Praise God. They got the malls for that. Don't strip down. <laughs> but we can dance. I've seen the, the worship team many times just up here jumping and dancing. It's okay to get excited about the things of God because you know what God is wanting to do in you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's go back to Moses before I get taken away and start rolling myself. Moses was asked to remove his sandals. Take it off because the presence you're in is a holy presence. The sandals. Prophetically, sandals Represent the soul. Why? Well, really, sandals only cover your soul. So it's the soulish realm God is wanting to deal with so you can step into with those sandals off the things of the spirit. So he says, take them off or you can't come near. So what did Moses do? He said, I'm stripping these bad boys off. I don't know why I'm stuck on stripping, but she's stripping the sandals off. Let me tell you what a scholar said about the removal of the sandals. He said, it's a confession of personal defilement and conscious unworthiness to stand in the presence of unspotted holiness. It's a conscious decision to lay down anything that could get in the way of what God wants to do. When God makes his appearance in your life, you have to make a choice. I'm going to set aside everything that could deter me from going as deep in God as he wants to invite me to. What's your sandal? What has God asked you to take off consistently? He's not going to take it off for you. There are certain things, and you know what they are, that God has whispered through his spirit. Turn this off. Put that down. This task needs to be finished. This person and their relationship is only taking you backwards. It's time to cut it off. What do you need to take off so that you can step into God's presence? Hmm. I woke up 4.40 a.m., not this morning, yesterday morning. And when I looked at the clock, obviously 4.40 and I heard God say, Isaiah 4, 4. And I looked it up, and this is what the Bible says. When the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and purged the blood of Jerusalem from her midst, the spirit of judgment or the spirit of justice and by the spirit of burning. It goes on to say, once the Lord has purged through the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning, 
those in Zion. Hello, those in Zion. Hello. Once you've been purged by the spirit of burning, he says he will put a cloud over your dwelling place and a fire within, and you will be carriers of the glory. <laughs> what, are, what are you refusing to take off? What can be removed so that the spirit of burning can come and wipe away everything so you can see God face to face? You say, wait a second, nobody's ever seen God face to face. Well, that's the point. That's the point. He says, seek my face and my strength forevermore. But you know the scripture, no man has ever seen God and lived. That's the point. We die. The soul gets removed so we can walk in the spirit. Do you want to see God? Do you want that spirit of burning? I just declare over you a burning within to remove the dross, to remove everything that is prohibiting you from seeing the face of God so you can go deeper. Hmm. Smith Wigglesworth. I tell my wife all these stories of old. I guess I'll share one with you. Smith Wigglesworth used to go in to a green room or a foyer or back room before he would minister and would grab the pastors and whoever else was on staff and say, brothers, let's pray. And he would just go in there and go after it. But there was one story in particular where he was at a week of meetings. A young man was on staff at this church. And he said, as Smith began to pray, he said, it was like clockwork. After a few minutes, the presence of God would come in very strong. And the longer he prayed, the more the presence lingered, but the more it intensified. And one by one, Everyone who was in the room began to leave. Every time. After a few minutes of prayer, and I say few, it was probably like 30 minutes to an hour. He was in there by himself. But the young man, he said, I refuse to leave this room. What it was, was the presence of God can't be in the same environment sin or unholiness is. And there was something that hadn't yet been removed or taken off in those men that couldn't stay in the presence of God. But Wigglesworth was a habitation. Wigglesworth was a carrier of the glory. He had the spirit of burning flowing through him. So the presence of God made manifest in many of his meetings and in prayer time. But the young man said, I'm going to make up my mind today. I'm not leaving that room no matter what happens. This is a true story. He said, just like always, Wigglesworth came in pre-meeting. Brothers, let's pray. They began to pray. The presence of God came in strong one by one, starting with the pastor. They begin to leave. And the young man said, I grabbed a hold of a table and wrapped myself around it. And he said, before long, the table began to shift little by little. And he said, after about an hour, the table was outside of the room and Smith was left alone again. Let it be said of us that we refuse to hold on, have on anything that would be irreverent, unworthy of his presence. It's time to remove the sandals. What's the sandal in your life? What's that thing the Holy Spirit keeps whispering to you? Say, hey, you want to go deeper, but this has got to go. Maybe it's unforgiveness. Maybe it's that person that you know they've done you wrong, but it's not a matter of who's right or who's wrong. It's a matter of being free before the Father and just letting them go so that you can go further. You know, if somebody's holding you back, they're in front of you. Think about that. You can't get to where God wants you to get because you've got a person in between you and God. So that person is ahead of you. Let's get around that person so we can get in face to face with God. I want all of God. How about you? God introduced himself to Moses by saying, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He says, I am the God of your fathers. Fast forward to the story I opened with in Acts chapter 3. Do you remember what happened after the man was healed? It said Peter and John were hanging out and everybody started staring at him, marveling at the miracle that had just taken place. And Peter looks at them and says, why are you looking at me like it's my own holiness or our power of our, in and ourselves that has done this great work? He says, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob and the God of our fathers has glorified his son Jesus in this act. I think it's time for a reintroduction of the God of Abraham to this generation. I think it's time, as Jay-Z would say, let me reintroduce myself. It's time for God to get a reintroduction to this generation. See, we're going and living in a generation right now that doesn't know the Abraham of the Bible. 
They don't know the Isaac. They don't know the Jacob. They don't know the Oral Roberts, the A.A. Allens, the William Branhams, the Charles Prices, the T.L. Osbournes, the Benson Itahosas. They don't know these great men of God. They just know you. And through you, you can give God a reintroduction. See, I, I've been talking to my wife, and we've made a personal covenant with God, a personal commitment. I've never seen my wife fast more than she's been fasting over these few weeks to see God do what he wants to do in California. I'm sorry. I think I'm special to God, and God didn't send me here for nothing. I could have stayed on the East Coast. Can I be real with you? I didn't want to come, but God said go, so I was obedient. So since I'm here, we might as well have revival anyway. Come on. Come on. Hallelujah. I told Shanette, there's got to be something where we can dig into and get up. There's got to be something more than church as normal. There's got to be something more than just waking up and having my quiet time with God. There's more for us. There's an impending revival. Souls are hanging in the balance. And somebody said, Alex, you're too serious. Well, hell is too serious. There's an eternity at stake. Maybe I need more monitor because my voice is going here. I don't know if you can tell. The Bible says in Genesis 26, 18, it says, Isaac dug again the wells of water that his father Abraham had dug. See, it had been a long time since those wells had been dung, dug and the Philistines had stomped them up. The world wants to clog up the well with all the cares in it, all the worries of tomorrow. But Isaac made a decision, said, I'm going back to the wells my father dug and I'm going to redig them. Do you know what happened when he dug those wells again? The Bible says in verse 19 of chapter 26 in Genesis that as they dug in the valley, they found a well of springing water. In the Hebrew, it literally means they found a well of revival. Living water was found in this well. I think about King David in Psalm 71, 18. He said, God, before I get too old, don't let me leave this world until I show your strength and power to this generation. Let that be our prayer, that you are set up, as Isaiah says, for signs and wonders here in Israel. You're set up to show God's strength and power. You're set up to burn a blaze for the things of God. I want to read you this. Speaking of men of old, T.L. Osborne. Anybody ever heard of him? I think he's one of the greatest men of God that ever been, has been used. And he probably, I don't stress the truth in saying this, seen more healings than anybody that's ever walked this earth. T.L. Osborne, believe it or not, was here in Turlock in the old chapel. That's where he proposed to his longtime wife, Daisy. Pastor Ron told me this. Do you know Amy Simple McPherson? Hello. She came through Turlock and through a prayer meeting, this church was founded. Do you know there's wells of revival here that we can redig? Amy Simple McPherson, in the midst of the Spanish flu, walked into Oklahoma like the baddest gal in town because she knew who she carried. In the midst of a global pandemic, a real pandemic, she set up shop and did a two-week healing crusade, laid hands on everything that moved. People were healed of the Spanish flu. In the midst of the Great Depression, I'm not talking about our economy now when you got the poorest people are homeless having iPhones. I'm talking about real poor. She paid cash only for her building. Do you know on Sunday nights, the Hollywood elitists and A-listers used to come sit in her service and try to steal creative ideas? We're coming back to that time in Jesus' name. We're going to begin to dig wells of revival and see God move like we've never seen. There's a rich history here, and that history is not by chance. That history from God was on purpose. There's a well that's needing to be redug. But T.L. Osborne proposed to his wife, Daisy, here in the balcony at the old chapel. But T.L. Osborne said this. He said, one day in prayer, the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, my son, as I was with Charles Price, Smith Wigglesworth and others, so I will be with you. These men are dead, but now it's your time to arise, to go and do likewise. Holy Spirit said, you can cast out devils. You heal the sick. You raise the dead. You cleanse the lepers. Behold, I give you power over all the power of the enemy. Don't be afraid, but be strong. Be of good courage because I'm with you as I was with them. He goes on to say, no evil power will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. 
And as you get the people to believe my word, I use those men in their day. And now my desire is to use you. That's what T.L. Osborne heard. But I'm going to prophesy over you. As your hands are lifted, God says, I desire. As your hands are lifted, one to be used by God. As God has spoken to the great men of old. He is with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. There's a fire coming on the inside of you to burn like you've never burned before. It's time for you to cast out devils. It's time for you to heal the sick. It's time for you to raise the dead. It's time for you to cleanse the lepers. Behold, there has been power given unto you to tread over all the power and authority of the enemy. God is with you and you cannot fail in Jesus' name. As I get ready to close, you say, why is this important? Because your destiny depends on the fire of God. Before you go to where God is calling you, you need to have something to give. Before Moses got sent to Pharaoh, Moses got the bush, baby. Before Jesus performed one miracle, the Holy Spirit came upon him. Before the disciples could be God's witnesses, they had to be filled with power. Jeremiah put it like this. He said, oh God, you've tricked me. Because when he called him, he didn't know what he was signing up for. But maybe some of you are a little scared because you don't know what God has for you. It's okay because God is with you. He said, he'll put something in you to carry you. So Jeremiah looked at God. He said, you tricked me. It feels like I got fire shut up in my bones. I can't keep quiet. May that be said of you that this fire comes out in Jesus name. John the Baptist was noted as being a shining and burning lamp. Jesus is noted twice in the book of Revelation as having eyes like fire. You know why that is? Because the eyes are the windows to what's inside. So what's inside is coming out of the eyes of Jesus. <laughs> Let it be said that when people look at you, they see Jesus. They see the fire of Jesus burning. I'll never forget a story I heard from Reinhard Bonnke. He said they needed a piano, so they went to a music store. And said when they went in, a guy came up to them, just all messed up, out of sorts, crying, weeping. He said, I, I need to receive Jesus. And Bonnke's like, man, I'm here just to buy a piano. I can't go anywhere. Whew, may that be your testimony. Ah, wherever you go, somebody's trying to grab the hem of your garment. They're trying to get in your shadow. They're trying to grab your cloth. Come on. That's that same power we can walk in. This isn't just Bible stories. Oral Roberts said the main street of the Bible is miracles. Get out of the byways of unbelief and believe that God wants to do something for you and through you. Hallelujah. Bonke looked at the man and said, get on your knees. Repent and recall on the name of Jesus and receive him. Later that day, Bonke was talking to the Lord and he said, how... Did that man see Jesus, see you in my eyes? And Jesus spoke back and said, I live on the inside of you. And sometimes I like to look out the windows. <laughs> Woo, may that be our testimony. See, you're wondering why nobody can look you in the eye sometimes when you're in public. It's because light drives out darkness. But let that light bring a comfort. Let it drive away and let the spirit of burning the fire of God burn through you. Hebrews 1, 7 says that God's servants, his ministers are a flame of fire. See, before God used all these men, he infused them with fire. Hmm. <laughs> God told Moses there in Exodus 3, as I read, he said, I have heard the cries of those that have been afflicted. Their cries have come up to me. And God said, I have come down to deliver them. But if you read, God didn't literally come down and do the delivering. He came down and came upon Moses. The Bible says God took form in the spirit in the book of Acts chapter two and came upon those that were waiting in the upper room. Prophetically, we're in a time where God has heard the cry of those that need deliverance. He's heard the cry of those that are praying, mothers and fathers, grandmothers and grandfathers, husbands and wives. He's heard the cry of the afflicted. And he said, I'm just looking for one that I can come down upon to bring deliverance. He's looking for one. In every generation, there's one person that has a heart's cry to be used mightily by God. In every generation, there's one that says, use me, Lord. I'll remove what needs to be removed so I can be filled to be poured out over and over and over again. Use me, God. Use me. As you stand to your feet, 
Your destiny is depending on the fire. You need something to give. Oh, hallelujah. It's the fire that breaks you out. It's the fire that gets people to come. It's the fire that purges. It's the fire that sets you on a place on high to empower you. I opened my message with talking about a menu and how we were false advertising in the restaurant, offering things we couldn't serve. Could I tell you God's menu is the Bible and he makes do and makes good on everything he's offering. And through you and I, we are the catalyst. We are the channel through which God will work miracles, signs, and wonders. Through you, you will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Through you, you will cast out devils. Through you, you will raise the dead. Through you, you will be set ablaze for the things of God. But that's gotta be your heart's cry because the only person that's preventing the fire is you. I talked a lot about school. Well, in school, they, they showed us Smokey the Bear. <laughs> Did y'all have that in California? He would say, only you can prevent wildfires. Only you can prevent the fire of God from purging out and empowering you to do the will of God. God wants to infuse you this morning to use you for his kingdom, to bring about the greatest revival we've ever seen.